shall bless themselves in him, and in him they shall glory. For thus saith the Lord to the men of Judah and Jerusalem, Break up your fallow ground, and sow not among thorns. Circumcise yourselves to the Lord, and take away the foreskins of your heart, ye men of Judah, inhabitants of Jerusalem, lest my fury come forth like fire, and burn, that none can quench it because of the evil of your doing. Declare ye in Judah, and publish in Jerusalem, and say, Blow ye the trumpet in the land. Cry, gather together, and say, Assemble yourselves, and let us go into the defense cities. Set up the standard toward Zion. Retire, stay not, for I will bring evil from the north in a great destruction. Uh, in this, uh, the Lord's been... Uh, telling Jeremiah to speak unto the people in the, uh, Judah and, and uh, Jerusalem. And in the fourth verse, he, he tells them, he says, to circumcise yourselves to the Lord and take away the foreskins of your heart. You know that uh, Israel uh, had been given a, a commandment to circumcise, but... Uh, this is a different circumcision. This is a circumcision of the heart to take away that bad part of that heart and, and throw it away and take it out and get rid of it. Uh, but he's asked, telling them to do that lest his fury come forth like fire and burn that none can quench it because of your evil doings. Evil, uh, Jerusalem and uh, Judah or Israel have been, uh, uh, been uh, backsliding and, and not... Uh, uh, giving the Lord all the credit that he do. They, they were like uh, living more unto themselves than they were living unto the Lord and that uh, in vain they were uh, doing these things and, and getting all worked up and proud and, and everything. And uh, the Lord was taking them down here telling them to, to do this and 
to declare in Jerusalem its light, blow the trumpet in the land, and cry together and say, Assemble yourselves and let us go into the defense city. The defense cities, I, I think, are the, are the cities where the, the Lord's put a hedge up about to protect them. And he's told them to go into and assemble themselves in those cities. Um, and I guess you could uh, kind of say that it was a, a type of the church. Because in the sixth verse, he says, Set up the standard toward Zion. Retire, stay not, for I will bring evil from the north and a great destruction. To tell them to, to, to put their uh, hope and their, their trust in, in, and look toward Zion. And, uh, uh, because he was getting ready to bring this, this evil and destruction uh, unto them. In the seventh verse, it says, The lion has come up from his thicket, and the destroyer of the Gentiles is on his way. He has gone forth from his place to make thy land desolate, and thy cities shall be laid waste without an inhabitant. For this, gird you with sackcloth, lament, and howl, for the fierce anger of the Lord is not turned back from us. And it shall come to pass at that day, saith the Lord, that the heart of the king shall perish, and the heart of the princes, and the priests shall be astonished, and the prophet shall wonder. Then said I, Ah, Lord God, surely thou hast greatly deceived this people and Jerusalem, saying, Ye shall have peace, whereas the sword reacheth unto the soul. Well, he had told them they'd have peace if they did those things that he had told them they needed to do. But they didn't do those things. They went about, like I said, being proud and, and uh, increasing their vanity and uh, not doing those things that the Lord told them to. At that time, shall it be said to this people in Jerusalem, a dry wind of the high places in the wilderness toward the daughter of my people, not to fan, nor to cleanse, even a full wind from those places that shall come unto me. Now also I give sentence against them. Behold, he shall come up as cloud, and his chariot shall be as a whirlwind. His horses are swifter than eagles. Woe unto us, for, for we are spoiled. O Jerusalem, wash thine heart from wickedness, that thou mayest be saved. How long shall thou vain thoughts lodge with thee? And they just didn't listen. Israel didn't listen. They kept putting their vain thoughts in, in front of God, been, uh, looking under, under thing, other, things other than unto him. And uh, uh, it told them that, to, that, that they need to wash their heart from wickedness so that they could be saved. Now what kind of salvation is this? It's not an eternal salvation. This salvation is one that, we're, uh, that we can have right here, right now, today. Uh, to put away those evil things, those bad things. Put away our idols. Put away all of our graven images. Put away all those things that uh, get between us and the Lord. And he told them that... Uh, if they do these things, that then, then that he would uh, keep them and uh, come unto them and be their God, they'd be his people. For a voice declare from Dan and publish affliction from out Ephraim. Make you mention to the nations, behold, publish against Jerusalem that watchers come from a far country and give out their voice against the cities of Judah. As keepers of a field, they are against her round the bell, because she hath been rebellious against me, saith the Lord. Thy way and thy doings have procured these things unto thee. This is thy wickedness, because it is bitter, because it reaches unto thine heart. So all those things that they put before themselves uh, that caused their vanity and, and their uh, uh, pride and everything was uh, coming from their heart. And he told them to put those things out of place from them, to, to uh, come unto him and uh, they wouldn't have all this trouble and stuff, but they wouldn't listen. They kept doing it over and over and over again. My bowels, my bowels, I am pained at my very heart. My heart maketh a noise in me. I cannot hold my peace because thou hast heard. O oh, my soul, the sound of a trumpet, the alarm of war. Destruction upon destruction is cried, for the whole land is spoiled. Suddenly are my tents spoiled and my curtains in a moment. How long shall I see the standard and hear the sound of the trumpet? For my people is foolish. They have not known me. They are sawish children, and they have none understanding, and are wise to do evil, but to do good they have no knowledge. 
I beheld the earth, and lo, it was without form and void, and the heavens, and they had no light. I beheld the mountains, and lo, they trembled, and all the hills moved lightly. I beheld, and lo, there was no man, and all the birds of the heavens were fled. I beheld, and lo, the fruitful place was a wilderness, and all the cities thereof were broken down at the presence of the Lord, and by his fierce anger. For thus hath the Lord said, The whole land shall be desolate, yet will I not make a full end. When he uh, told them these things, he told them that he was going to, that there would be pure desolation over Judah and Jerusalem. But yet, he still loved them. So he told them that I would, but yet I shall not make a full, I will not make a full end. For this shall the earth mourn and the heavens be above, be black, because I have spoken it. I have purposed it and will not repent, neither will I turn back from it. The whole city shall flee for the noise of the horsemen and bowmen. They shall go into thickets and climb up, up upon the rocks Every city shall be forsaken, and not a man dwell therein. And when thou art spoiled, what wilt thou do? Though thou clothest thyself with crimson, though thou deckest thee with ornaments of gold, though thou rendest thy face with painting, in vain shalt thou make thyself fair. Thy lovers will despise thee, they will seek thy life. For I have heard a voice as of a woman in travail, in the anguish as as of her that bringeth forth her first child, the voice of the daughter of Zion that bewaileth herself, that I spread her hand, saying, Woe is me now, for my soul is weary because of murderers. The Lord is uh, uh, telling them that, uh, again, you know, that he was going to do these things, and that the heavens above would be black because he had spoken it, he had purposed it. And he, and he will not repent or turn back from it. Uh, the whole city shall flee for the noise of the horsemen. There were so many uh, people coming in from the north that he had brought in up, up against them to fight them and to, and to, to slay them with the, the sword and uh, spoiling everything they did. And the whole city became desolation. And though they clothed themselves with crimson and decked themselves with ornaments of gold, they rinsed thy face with painting. They were doing this in vain. They they made themselves tried to make themselves fair. They uh, the their their own lovers decided to dis despise thee, and they turned against them to seek their life. For he heard uh, 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 a woman as if in travail, the, the voice of the daughter of Zion, and uh, uh, that uh, bewaileth herself that spread her wet hands, saying. Woe is me now, for my soul is worried because of murderers. Run ye to and fro through the streets of Jerusalem, and see now, and know and seek in the broad places thereof, if ye can find the man, if there be any that executeth judgment, that seeketh the truth, and I will pardon it. And though they say the Lord liveth, surely they swear falsely. He said if they could find one man that seeketh the truth, that he had pardoned the thing. O Lord, are not thine eyes upon the truth? Have, thou hast stricken them, but they have not grieved. Thou hast consumed them, but they have refused to receive correction. They have made their faces harder than a rock. They have refused to return. Therefore I said, Surely these are poor. They are foolish, for they know not the way of the Lord, nor the judgment of their God. I will get me unto the great men, and will speak unto them, for they have known the way of the Lord and the judgment of their God, but these have altogether broken the yoke and burst the bonds. Wherefore a lion out of the forest shall slay them, and a wolf of the evening shall spoil them, a leopard shall watch over their cities, every one that goeth out thence shall be torn in pieces, because their transgressions are many, and their backslidings increase. And in the next verse, How shall I pardon thee for this? Thy children have forsaken me, and sworn by them that are no gods when I had fed them to the full. He had given the fullest. He had given them everything. And they still turned back and turned against him and raised up uh, their own gods and idols in, 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 in front of him. And I had fed them to a full. They committed adultery and assembled themselves by troops in the harlot's houses. They were as fed horses in the morning. Every one named after his neighbor's wife. They each looked upon their neighbor's wife and uh, uh, coveted their neighbor's, neighbor's wife. They had all gone just uh, 
uh, to the dog, so to speak. Uh, none of them were wanting to do good. None of them were, uh, uh, would turn back to the Lord. And he asked, he said, shall not I visit uh, for these things? Or shall not I bring my rod against you for these things? And saith the Lord, shall not my soul be avenged on such a nation as this? Go ye up on her walls and destroy, but make not a full end. Don't take the whole thing and just and, and do the whole thing away. Don't make a full end unto it. Take away her battlements, for they are not the Lord's. For the house of Israel and the house of Judah have dealt very treacherously against me, saith the Lord. They have belied the Lord and said, It is not he, neither shall evil come upon us. They thought that after they were doing all these things, making themselves look good, uh, being vain, and raising up their gods, they thought that no evil would come unto them. Uh, uh, and uh, neither shall we seek sword nor famine. And then what do, you, what do you know? Whereas thus saith the Lord God of hosts, because you speak of this word, behold, I will make my words thy, in thy mouth fire, and this people would that shall devour them. It'll eat them up. It'll burn them up. And these people that were being... Uh, uh, against the Lord that were his people but they were not doing the things that they should have been doing it's just like what we can do here today we can, we're his people but do we do the things that we need to be doing do we put him first do we come and worship him the way that we're supposed to worship him the way that he asks us for he seeketh such to worship him those that would worship him in spirit and in truth and then uh, the same thing uh, where he talks about this here in, in, uh, in uh, Jeremiah is the same thing. It's just like it's been the same all through the ages from the, from the Old Testament times until now. It's the same thing. His people do the same thing. They will uh, turn against him. They'll go the other way. They'll uh, uh, take up their own idols. So, you know, we got idols today that people don't think are idols, but anything that comes between you and the Lord is an idol. Anything that you raise up, up above the Lord is an idol. Uh, we need to tear these things down. We need to take them away from us. We need to go back to the Lord and be with Him and seek His face and uh, ask His forgiveness that He would uh, come unto us and, and, and be with us and, and uh, uh, be our God as we are to be His people. I thank you very much. Uh, After hearing what you've heard, I'll ask you the question that came to my mind on the ride to church this morning is, why are we in church today? Well, let me put it very, hit it right at home. Why are you at church today? Are you here to serve the Lord? Are you here seeking His face? I know some of us are here because our parents brought us here. But there will come a time that your parents will bring you no more. My parents didn't wake me up this morning and say, Son, it's time to go to church. They did for many years. But there's come a time now that I want to go to church because I want to serve the Lord. Not because mom and dad's there, because my brother's there, my sister's there. I will be very blunt and forward with you that I have no parents, no, no siblings, at any of the churches that I attend anymore. Uh, I, I see my folks when I go to Rockville, but as far as Farmersville, Paris, Wichita Falls, I have no blood relation here. There's no brothers or sisters or parents here that are telling me I have to be here today. I'm here because I want to serve the Lord. And I pray that's what we're all here for, is because we want to come here and seek His face. We want to understand, we want to hear His word. We want to understand what is said in the scriptures about Him, that gives us such joy. And the question I ask after that is, how many people have you told about this? This is something that's been on my mind. I hope the Lord will permit it to, to, to come. If not, then, then you lay it to my charge. But I, I don't want to seem that I'm coming through with the ball bat, but, but I hope I'm coming through with love and charity when I ask these questions. Because, you know, when we have something like we have been blessed to have, which is this little congregation 
not only here, but wherever else we might meet. We have heard the, the, the preaching of saved by grace, Jesus Christ and Him crucified, plus nothing is our eternal uh, seal in heaven, and not anything that we've done of ourselves. How many people have we been blessed, or how many people have we blessed, in telling them of these same graces and seeing the, these same things that have happened in our life? How many times have I talked to my neighbor and told them that I am glad to be going to church? You know, I don't want to be sneaking out the front door and going to church. I, I would much rather not, not to pat myself on the back, but I hope somebody sees me and asks me, says, where are you going? I said, I'm going to go to the house of the Lord, and I'm going to go and try and praise Him in the perfect way and lift Him up uh, to where He belongs. Instead of keeping him down low where I drag him to. So many times in my life, whenever I put myself in these pitfalls in life, I take him with me. But I am thankful that he is a gracious God, a long-suffering God, and he picks me back up to these places when I'm able to come up into Bethlehem and I'm able to see the fruits of his labor and I'm able to look upon God's people's faces and see the smiles and hear the, the kind words that come from them and it lifts my soul up for just a little while and I'm able to go one step further. I hope that that is what we do today. We don't need to confine our love and our blessings the uh, peace that we have to this four walls here. <clears throat> but we should be letting all that are around about us to know whenever there is one that asks you a question, well, why is it Brother King is always smiling? Why is it he's always looked so happy? Be ready to give him an answer. It's not because, oh, well, I woke up in a good mood and, and, and my wife gave me a kiss and it just made my day. Well, uh, it, it does happen that way sometimes, but I want to tell you that most of the time, if I get up and I have a smile on my face, it's because the Lord has blessed me to get up. He's blessed me to take another breath. He's blessed me to have a job. He's blessed me with three beautiful children. He's blessed me with a wife that takes care of me when she don't have to do so. I have been blessed beyond measure. What else do I need to do? What else do I need to say to you? Uh, I need to be tell, constantly telling God for him what that he's done for me. Thank you. Thank you for what you've given unto me. And, and I want to walk in a way that others might see my life and, 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 and see my good works and glorify the Father which is in heaven. I don't want to be walking around with a uh, look on my face. Now, uh, don't, don't ask my wife later because there, there's times that when she looks up on my face, she'll ask me why I'm mad. Well, that's not, that's just, I can't help it sometimes. My, that's the way my face looks. But, but I am telling you, we need to be walking around with a smile on our face. You know, I, I told you some circumstances came up uh, and, and, it's, and it forced my hand to shave early. Well, the circumstance that came up was I lost my dear uncle, which is one that I hold so near and dear to me. I don't come up here to tell you and lift him up in any way. But this man, even though he be not blood to me, he was not born into my family, but he yet married into the family. But I'm telling you that he was one of the closest men in my life. He was the one that took me down into the baptistry and baptized me into the church. He was my first pastor that I ever had. He was the one that when my grandfather died, he stood beside me and put his arm round about me and said that he is in peace and he's at home with his Lord. He preached the gospel all his time that he had when he was able to walk and come to understand. He did not grow up a primitive Baptist, but he married into the primitive Baptist and he started to preach the gospel because he had heard what the blessed Lord had done for him and for all of his people. And he started to proclaim them things unto people. And this is what we should do when we stand before God's people. We need to be given ready to give answer for what he's done for us. He was a prime example of what we should do because as I said he did not uh, grow up in the church as I have been blessed to do and I don't say that in bragging but I thank him for the blessing to be raised in the truth my whole life and understanding but he is one that grew up uh, to a young adult and then later married into the Premier Baptist and then later on became joined the church and started preaching the gospel. We need to be standing fast on these things. We have these things that, that have been given unto us, so we shouldn't take them lightly. We all have dear brothers and sisters in the ministry 
or in the family that have been blessed with these things. Uh, uh, back to what I was trying to say, if I, if I had a point that it is not a blood relation as we know it. We are all blood related this morning. But it's not in the fancies of blood relation. We are all blood related through the shed blood of Jesus Christ. We carry His DNA. You know that you can't have an inheritance without being linked through a, an inheritance, through family, through inheritance, through love. He is the one that has set up this inheritance for us. He made us, <clears throat> he made us heirs with God and joint heirs with Christ. Joint heirs. That is such a beautiful word. I didn't understand it for a long time. But joint heir doesn't mean, if I, if I made my two sons joint heirs, that doesn't mean that they get 50 and 50 of what I have left. But they both get 100% of what I got. They are joint heirs. It cannot be divided with them. It stays together. Now man's laws have taken a place and they have corrupted this But in a natural standpoint. But in a spiritual standpoint, I want us to understand that us being joint heirs, we all are equal with Christ when it comes to His salvation. We all are equal with Him. We don't have to do anything. He did it all. He paid it all. He went alone. And He took care of it. And He has given it unto us freely. Given unto us freely. Where is, where is it that we have that we should drop our heads down and say, Oh, I just can't get out of bed today. You know, it's too rough. It's too hard. You know, the world is it is coming to an end. I tell you, I'm almost sick with those statements that I'm hearing nowadays. That, that the world is just getting too bad. It's just going too far. Well, I'm going to tell you, dear brothers and sisters, it has went bad. When we have men lying with men, and women lying with women, and we killing unborn children, we are going astray. But let us not forget that He is the King. Set him on his throne. He has not weakened and he has not faltered. He is still in control today. We as God's people need to stand up and bow our heads and pray unto him that he would give us his peace and his light back into our life, into our country, into our churches, that we might serve him in a more perfect way. That is where we stand today. We stand just as strong today as we did yesterday. But we let the things of the world come into our life and creep in and bring us down. You know, you have just heard this dear brother stand before us. And, and in Jeremiah, it talks about these things that had came up. That as they were talking about those ones that, that were were. Putting their own, putting on the fancy garments and putting on the gold and painting their faces. You know what they were doing? They were just covering up the truth is all they were doing. The truth was still there. They were still just as corrupt then as they were when they, before they put it on. Because they do not hide those things from God. He sees each and every one of them. And he gives them uh, that, that they stand in need of. You know, I, I also get tired of hearing our dear brothers uh, in the faith of... Uh, I'm not saying in Pentecostal Baptist, but uh, their brothers and uh, sisters in Christ, when they come up to you and they see these things going on, and they come and they say, well, they will pay for it in that judgment day. I tell you, that is a false statement. There is coming a judgment day. But the judgment day that is coming before the great white throne of judgment, he says, come ye, blessed of my Father, inherit the kingdom. What does that say? That you had to do something to inherit. Nowhere. But there is a judgment that we live each and every day of our life. I can tell you that to be so. I have felt it upon me uh, throughout the week and throughout my life. When I do things that are contrary unto the scriptures. I am then judged for what I have been doing. I am then judged for that that I have been done. And I am convicted in my heart because I know that I have done that contrary to my blessed Lord. 
The judgment day doesn't wait. He judges us daily in that that we do. I tell you, uh, what kind of father would I be if my son, as he acted out, and kind of on acting up, and I just walked up to him and, and patted him on the back and said, you just wait until a day that I have set aside, and then I'm going to just really lay into you for what all you've done wrong. By then he has forgotten what he has done wrong. He has forgotten the punishment what the punishment is for. But if I have the rod of correction come upon him, as soon as that problem comes up, he then understands why the rod of correction has come upon him, and he understands, oops, don't do that again, because I know what's going to happen. Well, hey, guess what? Uh, he is uh, a son full of flesh in my flesh and bone in my bone, and guess what? He does it again. And guess what happens? The rod of correction comes upon him again and reminds him that he's not to do these things. Are we so thankful that we have the same long-suffering Father in heaven that judges us daily and when we do it wrong and he comes up to us and he tells us this is what you've done wrong, you then don't do it again, that, that when we do it again, guess what? He tells us the same thing. He gives us the same correction as we give our own natural children. We don't set aside a time for our children when we judge them for what they've done wrong. I'm telling you, I don't set aside a time. I was, I'm very young, but as, as uh, some mother would say, I was raised old school. Whenever I got in trouble, I got corrected right then and there. You know, there was plenty of times I will give you a little story uh, to tell on myself a little bit. The little church where I grew up, we had these, uh, we called them the, the theater seats. They were the spring loaded that would fold up and down. Well, I can tell you, I used to love to sit in there and it would get quiet. And, and I'd sit there and I'd rock that seat and that seat would go, wee, wee, start squeaking. <laughs> About that time, I'd get thumped on the head. I knew I had done something wrong. She didn't lean over and say, you wait till judgment day and I'm going to take care of this. Uh-uh. <laughs> Our Heavenly Father is the same way. He's going to correct His children. And He's going to give them that they stand in need of. That that our brother has talked to us about and preached to us about this morning is that it's been preached all through the ages of time. Preached to us time and time again. Why do we need to be told and told again? I, you, you tell me why I have to tell my son, no, 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 no. And then I will tell you why we need to be preached time and time again the same thing. We are of all as sheep gone astray. But we have a shepherd that loves us. And when we go astray, he leaves the 99 and goes and brings us back and puts us right back at home where we belong. When we don't deserve it, we don't deserve to be in this place. Maybe I'm being bold by saying that, but I'm telling you that we are all gone astray. We need His guidance daily. We need His, His correction daily. You know, you see the shepherds in all the pictures and they're carrying this real long staff with a hook on it. He didn't carry it around just to threaten them and tell them, oh, well, you wait until I decide to threaten you. When the sheep got out of line, he took it and he would get them back into where they belonged. We need to be corrected. We need to hear it time and time again. We need to hear Jeremiah read to us this Sunday, next Sunday, every Sunday. We need to hear the 8th chapter of Romans. We need to hear the 10th chapter. We need to hear all of the gospel preached. We need the whole gospel of God preached to us. You know, we have, uh, have taken a time to where we have wanted to preach sermons that make everybody all fired and happy. They, well, let's preach a good, happy sermon so everybody's smiling and everybody's happy when they leave. Well, dear brothers and sisters, I can remember a time when I used to love to hear them happy songs sung. Uh, there was a dear brother out in West Texas, he called them the popcorn songs because they, they had this up-tempo to them. They made you feel happy. But I'm telling you, I like the minor songs today. I like to hear those long, low, drawn-out songs because they tell me of what a sinner I am that doesn't deserve to have anything but by the grace of Jesus Christ and His Father which is in heaven I'm able to come and darken these doors and set into the drippings of the sanctuary and eat the crumbs that fall from the Master's table for a little time. We don't all need to be sitting here singing these good songs. We need the minor songs too. 
They are those that have had pricked our hearts when we sing them. And they can bring us a, 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 a conviction upon us and an understanding of where we are. You know, as the brother was speaking this morning, a thought came to my mind about the light, the candle that is put within us. <clears throat> you know, the preaching of the gospel is a type of fanning the flame. Have you ever tried to put a fire in the fireplace? You light it, and if you don't fan it or blow on it just a little bit, it'll just go right back out. But well, we need to have our flame blown on just a little while. Whenever you come into the drippings of the sanctuary and you hear the gospel preached, and you leave, whether it be a gospel preached of happiness or it be a gospel preached on, on uh, duty or it be a gospel preached on, on whatever it might be, and you leave and you feel lifted up, that flame has been fanned for just a little while. But we as God's children need to also be careful because what happens if you blow too hard? You blow it out. We are to fan the fires with the gospel, but we are not to blow it out. You know, and you say, well, Brother Kim, you're, you're kind of putting yourself in a position a little higher than you should, don't you think? Because God's the one that places that light in there. He does. He's also able to take it away. Brother, it be how, whatever circumstance, if there's a dear child that has grown up in the church, or even if it's a child in the church that's 80 years old, if we start to come in, like a, as a, my daddy would say, a bull in the china closet, we start to break things. We start to put out flames because we start to do things that are contrary. But when we do the things that thus said the Lord, we fan them flames that are within our hearts. And when we leave this place, we are lifted up to a place where we can't even imagine to be. And that's a place of peace, a place of mercy, a place of grace. We come here for that same simple purpose. We come here to be told again you know, I think of the scripture when, when John's disciples came to him because John was in prison. He was in a low place. He was in a really low place. And he sent his disciples, he says, go and ask him, is he the Christ or should we look for another? And when they come and they ask Christ, Christ says, you tell, go and tell John again. Go and tell him again that the blind see, the lame walk, Poor have a gospel preached unto them. Tell him again. We need to be told again when we come here. You know, if we are to come to church so we can be saved, to heaven and more to glory, then we need to come one time and we're done. But we need to be saved daily. Our eternal salvation has been fulfilled, completed, done, finito. I, I can't speak any other language. It's say finished. But it's done. We come for a time of salvation. We come here to be saved again and again and again. Sometimes it's hard to accept that salvation because there's a conviction that comes with it. There's a conviction of what you've done wrong. A conviction of what you've done and seen and heard and things you've done contrary to the scriptures. But you know, even when your mind is focused upon the Lord, those same convictions fan that flame. And it grows higher and higher and higher. Because you have been given that peace to understand that we have a long suffering God. <clears throat> I, I say all that. I hope, I, I want to take some time and, and read a verse or two of Scripture. Hopefully not taking them out of context. But uh, if I can find where I want to be. Uh, it's in the Second Thessalonians, the second chapter. For second time, it says in the 13th verse, says, but, but we are bound to give thanks always to God for you, brethren, beloved of the Lord, because God hath from the beginning chosen you to salvation through sanctification of the Spirit and belief in the, of the truth, whereunto he called you by our gospel to the obtaining of the glory of the Lord Jesus Christ. Wherefore, brethren, stand fast. This is what I've tried to talk about this morning. Stand fast. Whenever the world weighs on you, stand fast. Whenever they tell you that it's okay if a man and a man get married because it doesn't affect you in any way, stand fast. When they tell you that it's not killing a baby, it's just the mother's choice, stand fast. 
because we need to be understanding that Jesus Christ has said that these things are wrong. If you don't believe that he's talked about us, uh, I'm just going to say the word, I'm sorry, but if you don't believe that he is talking about gays and lesbians, then you need to go read about Sodom and Gomorrah. And you need to understand that he destroyed the city because of their infidelity, because of what they've done. Does, can he do it? Yeah, he has the power to do it again. Are we to be a, a, the saving grace and go around and tell them that they're doing wrong? No, but we're to understand that we are not to allow this to enter into our hearts or our minds because it is contrary to the scriptures. We should stand fast in that he's given us and hold to the tradition. Wait a minute, brother. Can we hold to tradition? Yes, we do. We hold to tradition unless they are contrary to the commandment of God. And if you look, that most traditions that we bring back us hold to are those that thus say the Lord. Those are thus said the Lord that we follow. We don't follow because Brother Randy says so or, or Brother Buddy says so, but we follow because they follow Christ. That's what Paul said. He says, come and follow me. Not because I'm Paul, but follow me because I follow Christ. There's a tradition that goes by following. There's a tradition that we follow after. You know, I would venture to say, if you read the scriptures, the way that we hold and conduct our service is not necessarily the way they conduct the service in the biblical time. You know, we come together, we sing for 30 minutes, we offer prayer, and then we stand and we try and preach if the Lord bless for an hour, and then we close out with prayer and a song and shake hands. That, I don't know that that's the way they've done it back then, but it's a tradition that we have. And it's a good tradition. Does it take away from the, the blessings and the and God? No, it does not. Uh, what if we were to come in here and sing for 15 minutes and then and then have prayer and then have a preaching for an hour and then we sing for 15 more minutes and then put another preacher up? Is there anything wrong with that? No, but if a tradition was to come about, it would be the same way. They, they would think that we were doing it crazy because we didn't have two come up. We need to understand the traditions when they hold to the scripture, they are something we should hold fast to. It says... It says, uh, therefore, brethren, stand fast and hold the traditions which ye have been taught, whereby, <clears throat> whereby word or epistle. Whether you have been told it or it has been written unto you. You know, all these that we read, Colossians, Thessalonians, <clears throat> Timothy, well, I'll take Timothy type, but Thessalonians and, and uh, Ephesians, Colossians. And all those, those are all epistles that were wrote to a church by the Apostle Paul and other individuals. He says, if you have been wrote these in an in epistle or have been told them by word, hold fast to them. Why? Because they are the truth. Because they are that that is thus said the Lord. If we have one that comes about and starts preaching a false doctrine, and and it happens that I was, I was reading and, and doing some some different researches on this week about an individual that came about and, <clears throat> and went and conjoined himself to a, a denomination and then before long he became their their leader and then he started telling them, you know, that when you join the church your marriages are annulled and they don't have to be taking place no more. And the reason he was doing this is so that he could have free reign of the women within his congregation. This is things that when we see them, because when they come up, we know they are not the truth. Why? Because they are not thus said the Lord. When you have a tradition that comes up, and it doesn't weigh up to the scripture, you hold not fast to that tradition. You hold fast to those that the Lord has given unto us in epistle and in word. He says, now, our Lord Jesus Christ himself and God, even our Father, which hath loved us, and hath given us everlasting consolation and good hope through grace. Comfort your hearts and establish you in every good word and work. Wait a minute. You tell them the primitive Baptists that there's a work for them to do? Yes, there is. Otherwise, these words would not be here. Just like I tried to quote the, the scripture while ago, and I tried to quote it again. It says, let your light so shine that others might see your good works see your good works, might see your good works, and glorify the Father which is in heaven. It doesn't say in there that it might see your good works so you can obtain eternal life. It doesn't say that you could, they could see your good works and pat you on the back. It 
doesn't say that they will see your good works and erect a monument in your name. No, it says that they will see your good works and glorify the Father which is in heaven. We are to do good works. There is a work for us to do. The work for us to do is serve Him in spirit and in truth. Whenever we have this occasion to sit and talk to God's people, I don't care if they're French Baptist. I, I don't care if they're Protestant, Catholic, Evangelical. It doesn't matter. They're God's people. You have the time to sit and talk to them and have a pleasant conversation about the blessed Lord and what He's done for us thus far in our life. You have been blessed to be able to sit and hear the Word of God for a little time. You know, we need to be careful what soapboxes or what pedestals we might put ourselves on because we thought might think we are ourselves a lot higher than we should. As them others did when they would put on their apparels and, and put on their, their faces, as they would say. No offense to the women here this morning. They would put those things on to cover up. We shouldn't be ones that we have to put on this cloak or something of high-mindedness that we're above others but be able to come. You know, what is Christ? When, when Christ was asked the question, who is the greatest in here? I think it's what the question he was asked. Well, it says, who can enter the kingdom of heaven? That's what it was. And he brought and set a little child in front of him. He said, unless one comes as a little child, he cannot inherit and cannot enter into the kingdom of heaven. So does that mean that we're to come in here and act like our children do? No, that's not what it says. It says we're to come in as a little child. A little child is one that comes forth begging the mother and father for guidance. Comes forth watching every step that they make because they don't know for sure what they're to do, where they're to go. You know, whenever I would go into a new place, I would stand right behind my dad. And if he turned left, I turned left. If he turned right, I turned right. Because I wanted to be sure that I stayed in order whenever we went to a place that I should go. We come as little children and we follow the Lord. We come as little children and we stay in step with Him. When He turns left, we turn left. When He turns right, we turn right. And then we understand the walk that we're supposed to be walking. That's why Paul told him, he says, follow me. Follow me. Don't follow me because I follow the fall. Me because I follow Jesus Christ. We have these blessed peace and hope given unto us daily. It's not confined to Sunday morning. Your, your, your blessings are not confined to Sunday morning. They're throughout your life. I can stand up here if the Lord will permit and take time and tell you just not even a sixteenth of the blessings of my life. And it would take until not fall. We have blessings that occur throughout our lives, not on Sunday mornings only. We have this because of our blessed Savior Jesus Christ. It says, comfort your hearts and establish in every good word and work. We should be watching our dear brothers and sisters, not to try and correct them or try and find some fault in them, but we should be trying to watch our dear brothers and sisters because there are things that they have come through that we haven't yet. There are things that they have seen, but we have yet to see. There are things that I have seen that some of my elder brethren have not yet to see. We are to be one, one accord. He says we are one body. We go together. We don't separate out. We don't break up into to groups to where we have to have the the, the ch little children in, in one room and, and dumb it down enough for them to understand and then, then make it a little smarter for those smarter kids, a little smarter for the smarter kids, a little smarter for the adults. That is not how we break it up. We are one body. We are the body of Christ. He's the head. He's the one in control. He's the one we look to. We don't look to Paul. We don't look to Randy. We don't look to Kenny. We don't look to Brother Thomas. We look to Jesus Christ. He is our, he, well, let me put it this way. He is the shepherd. Brother Thomas, as I told you before, is the under-shepherd of this little congregation. But he cannot shepherd all of us by the people. Jesus Christ can shepherd every single one of his people at one time.
one time. He's able to shepherd this congregation, Farmerville. He's able to shepherd them all. As was said, this opening was one of the kids, omnipresent. He's everywhere present and nowhere absent. He is the one that we come to serve. Let us look to one another and stand fast in the things that have been given to us, the traditions that have been given to us in epistle and word. Well, not because they have just been told to us over and over again, but because we have studied the scriptures and read them and found them to be true and faithful. Because these are the things that Christ has written for our benefit. And I tell you again, they were written by Christ. They were handwritten by men, but they were handwritten by men that were moved by the Holy Spirit. Christ himself penned these words for us. You look in the scriptures in the Old Testament. He told those Pharisees and Sadducees, he says, you search the scriptures and think you find eternal life, but they are they which testify to me. He told us the story of his life before he got here in the Old Testament. Now he told us the story of his gospel, the story of his ministry, the story of his death, and the story of his resurrection, and he's also given us the story of his return. We have plenty of stories to tell. And one thing that I left the, the little family of my uncle with, I will kind of rearrange and leave with you this morning. We all have had a storyteller in the family. Maybe you are the storyteller in the family. And I'm not talking about tall tales. I'm talking about family stories that are passed down from generation to generation. You know, I can tell you a couple from our family that were passed down. If you've heard them a thousand times, tell them a thousand more times. Because that is how that individual that has gone home to be the Lord stays with us in our mind and in our heart. It's when we continue to tell them stories about what has happened in their life. We have a better story to tell than that. We have been given the stories of Jesus Christ and he's gone home to be with the Father. Let us tell the stories a thousand more times, even though we've heard them a thousand. That they might stay fresh within our minds and that we might carry them with us and tell them to our friends, tell them to our family, tell them to our kids, Tell them to our grandkids, and if the Lord blesses, tell them to our great grandkids and our great great grandkids. Keep telling them over and over again. If you have a minister that comes in and preaches something new to you, I give you the word of advice. Find the door as fast as you can. Because there's nothing new here. Everything you hear is going to be the same thing you've heard before. It may come at you in a new way. If I can try and clear this just a little bit. It may come, up, come at you in a new way, but it's going to be the same story told, which is grace, mercy, and peace. That's the only way that you can preach the gospel. It's through grace, mercy, and peace. It's the only way you can hear the gospel. So let us tell the stories again. Let us tell the tradition again. Let us tell the word again to not just this little congregation, but to all that come and cross our paths. Because whenever you find that time to be able to sit and talk with them. You feel yourself going away a little lighter with your feet, and they go away a little bit lighter with their feet, because they've been lifted up for just a little while from the cares of the world. Not worried about the things, but you've talked about Jesus Christ and Him crucified. I thank you for your very kind attention. If there be any here that's like you not in this church, you come forward and let your desire be known and wait upon you. It's our order. And also, if it be that we'll stand together and sing some suitable hymn off of the right hand of fellowship.